Hi everyone here in Kiggins on Appledore Island and online joining us tonight. I'm Jennifer Seavey. I am the director here at Shoals Marine Laboratory and welcome to our Rock Talk, otherwise known as a Marine Science Seminar. And it's live from the island this summer. Our format tonight is 45 minutes of uh, amazing talk by Dre and then 15 minutes of Q&A. If you're in the room, you can just raise your hand Dre will um, call on you. And if you're online, please use that Q&A box at the bottom. Put your questions in there and I will field them and read them out loud. If you need any technical help, please use the Q&A box as well. So I'm very, very happy to have Dr. Andrea Bogomoni, otherwise known on the island as Dre. She is an interdisciplinary community scientist. She is working to improve ocean and human health. I know there's some One Health fans in this group here. So yeah, um, a great example of the kinds of things that she does is finding ways to solve marine, complicated marine system conflicts, like for example, great white sharks, seals and commercial fisheries. Think about Cape Cod and all that you've heard in the news about all the interaction between those three things. She currently holds the following positions, a program officer at the Island Foundation. She's the steering committee chair at the Northwest Atlantic Seal Research Consortium. And I'd say most importantly, or most glamorously, she is also a mentor in the surge program, the Shoals Undergraduate Research Group on a long-term monitoring project right over there on Duck Island. She's also helped, this is really for the students in this group, um, she has held many positions at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. You can ask her about that after the talk. She has an undergraduate degree from Boston University in marine biology. Oh, sorry, that's a master's degree. She double majored in her undergraduate degree in wildlife biology and fine arts, amazing artist at UC Davis. And she has a PhD from the University of Connecticut in pathobiology and veterinary science. So she told me today that she boils it all down to her love of dogs and food, especially cake, which we got some of tonight. And here she is. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. All right. Now, you have to make sure this part works. With all that, with all that intro, can I make the screen work? That's like the most important part. Awesome. Looks good? Okay, perfect. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm like beyond excited for many reasons. One that I can give this talk about seals and society. And if, if you're here, you can look that way to the seals that make this possible in my life. Um, Duck Island and Ledges is right there and this beautiful sunset, which hopefully talk louder. Okay, I'll, I'll try, I'll try. Let's see if we can get, <laughs> awesome. So, what I want to present to you today, I get really excited about, and it is a story. So I wanted to tell a story about seals, but in a way that incorporates us. Because I think oftentimes the us part, the human part is forgotten when we tell the story about all these organisms around us and why we are all here and why we're studying them. And seals <laughs> have a very complex relationship in the Northwest Atlantic. So that's where we're gonna start today. All right, make sure this works. So I love this picture. This is from Steve Deneef and he's an amazing photographer. And these are two gray seals off Duck Island and ledges. And when I tell this story, it's so important to me to ground oneself in what we're talking about. These animals are amazing to me. They're interesting, they're curious, they're smart. And oftentimes when we do science, sometimes it's easy to forget the fascination that we have with the thing that we're actually trying to understand. So take some time when you're doing a study or out there to remember what it was that brought you to this place that makes you so excited to do the work that you're doing. For me, part of that excitement is understanding how other people have connected, especially to seals through our history. And it is a story, and there's stories all over the world about how people connect to marine mammals and seals. 
And it's this fascination with marine mammals that it's not new. Like, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many people when they find out, oh, you study seals. Oh, that's so amazing. Or there's this different kind of energy or whales. Whales usually get, or sharks. Sharks probably get more, more attention. But when you talk about marine mammals, people get excited. And that's happened for thousands of years. And one of my favorite stories to share is that of Sedna. And I'm going to do very brief stories, so hopefully I do it justice. But she's the goddess of the sea of marine mammals and ruler over the Inuit underworld. And she is still a very important deity in Inuit culture. And if you take too much from the ocean, she gets very upset. So we'll put it that way. So she's still considered a protector. And long story short, uh, she was in this accident um, with her father, her fingers got cut off and those fingers fell to the bottom of the ocean and became all the marine mammals. They first became the walrus and the seals and then everything else. <laughs> but basically, if you make her upset, the harvests won't happen. Um, it's out of balance. So you have to keep her appeased by keeping balance. So that story specifically with seals is really important in many cultures. And one of the stories that people may be more familiar with is that of the Selkies. So Selkies as well are stories that go back for millennia about an animal, human basically, a seal that can take a human form. And interestingly, a lot of these stories are, they can be men or women, but if they're upset because their human form, say husband makes them upset, they will find their sulky skin and return to the sea. So another story of appeasing um, the gods, so to speak, and making sure the seals are, are kept happy. But these stories are really important culturally, not just for kids, but this is a great movie if you haven't seen Song of the Sea. That story about selkies, let's see if I can make that advance. Um, this is another great story. This is a real story about a selkie is one that comes from an unexpected source. So our relationship with marine mammals isn't just a folklore or studying, but if you didn't know, marine mammals are currently used for, um, for protecting our country. So they're part of the military. Um, and Selkie was the oldest gray seal to be in captivity and live to be 43 years old. And she was a former Navy SEAL, and she was actually trained to use a screwdriver during the Cold War. So people, when they say these animals are so smart, I can't figure them out, like how do I keep them out of my nets? They're not exaggerating. Um, gray SEALs in particular are very smart animals, and they, they were actually trained, true fact, to use a screwdriver. So... The story about these animals and these, this folklore and this history and, and with the Navy um, aren't the only stories. We often forget that we have really important stories here in our own backyard. We don't have to go very far to understand these relationships. So we know through archeological records and actually off smutty nose right here, I love, to, I love giving this talk right here, this is so exciting. You can find remnants of where people kind of throughout their trash, you could say, so to speak, native people, indigenous people, and those are called middens. And these middens often have shells and bones. And in these middens, you can find bones of seals. And it's usually the ear bones of the seals that you find or the very big pieces that are, are left behind that were very strong. And these middens, those are sites um, along the Eastern seaboard of middens that contain gray seal remains. And we know that this relationship between seals and humans goes back at least 4,000 years. We know that people have been here longer, 12,000 or more, but the evidence that's left behind that at least we've excavated goes back 4,000 years of this overlap. And it's possibly longer, we just haven't gotten to it or it's been inundated by sea level rise and there's something out there yet for us to discover. But at least we know our relationship goes very far back in time. So now we're going to fast forward in our story. So we were 4,000 years back, and now we're going about to the 1600s. And these people discovered this amazing place, and they decided to call it this creative name called New England, because that was creative, and came to New England because there were a lot of resources here. And those bones, the fish, everything that was found in those middens that Native people were using were the same types of resources that explorers were, were exploiting, you could say, at that time in the 1600s, 1700s. And that's what built up cities. That's what built up one of the biggest um, whaling and fishing ports in the, in the nation, which was New Bedford. And we entered this era of exploitation. 
So in a very short amount of time, um, we really entered an era where resources were taken out faster than they could be replenished by nature. And it didn't take long for people to realize that there wasn't this inexhaustible ocean. Um, and this quote kind of says it for me, it is only in the last few years when the fishing fleet has suffered from a marked scarcity of haddock that the folly, the belief, the inexhaustibility of nature has become potent. And this really occurred um, for the whale fisheries and that's a sperm whale, those are barrels of oil from the whales, that's New Bedford. And then just the amount of fish and cod is the, the poster child fish here, especially in New England and where I live on Cape Cod about how we exploited resources. And so in that short amount of time, we depleted them. And that's a you know, true story in our story, right? We did a good job of exploiting resources. So how do seals fit into this story that I'm telling you? Well, seals were caught really in the crossfire is one way to look at this. This is a harbor seal and this is a gray seal. And this is an image right off of Duck Island. And when this era of exploitation hit, there was a scapegoat. And even though we know there was this era of exploitation, there was a belief that the seals were reducing the fish so much that they had to be removed because there were no fish left. And that caused uh, quite a concern if you were a seal, because in Maine and Massachusetts, this, there were state sanctioned bounties, which are hunts put on animals for the sake of removing them from a population for no other reason other than to remove them. So not like to eat and things like that, but um, it was very successful. And this is an article that, that came out during that time in the 1880s. And it says bounty of snouts and flippers. So basically if you brought a nose or a flipper back to town hall, they give you a dollar or $5. This was probably one of the most effective ways to eliminate animals you could possibly imagine. Um, there was this really strong um, thought that if, if this fishery were to, to come back, it only could happen if these animals that were eating fish that you saw were gone. And so this is the act that was passed to provide a bounty for the destruction of seals. And it was very effective. It was so effective that gray seals were extirpated from the United States and they were extirpated locally. There were none, zero. So we see today a couple hundred animals out there just in this one ledge. There were none, zero, you couldn't find one. And there were only a, or a few hundred harbor seals remaining in the area. And this idea that, you know, okay, now they're, they're gone, we'll get a fishery back wasn't the case. In research that was done looking through the bounties, there was a belief that there wasn't any amount of animals that were gone to be sufficient to change fishers' attitudes toward these animals. And that was well-documented. It didn't matter if they were gone, they, they needed to keep being gone. <laughs> there wasn't like a, a good level. So people, not all people believe that this was a great thing. Um, and in 1965, the Gray Seal Protection Act was passed. This was passed um, with support from people on Nantucket and gray seals are also called Nantucket horseheads. So there's a strong affinity to the region for these animals so much so that they have the name of a place that's very important to them. And it said that no person, no person shall willfully detain, hunt, kill, or injure a gray seal. So very different than what had just happened in the last 80 years where there was this understanding that they were gonna lose this, this entire species if nothing was done. So that was in Massachusetts in 1965. Some people know, if you don't know, that after that in 1972, there was an, a law that protected all marine mammals. So not just seals, but all marine mammals were being exploited either for the resources or because they were perceived as competition. And so in 1972, the, the US Marine Mammal Protection Act passed. And to note, it was the first US ecosystem-based management law um, in the oceans passed. And the primary objective, I always tell people, and I say the same thing, is it's not because they were cute and fuzzy or had cool tusks or they were really neat. It was because the primary objective was to maintain the health and stability of the marine ecosystem. So people realized that we were taking them out without understanding what was gonna to happen to the oceans, what was gonna to happen to our ecosystem if they were all gone. And that's what this law did. And it put such great protection across the board on all species of marine mammals in US waters. So yay, right? <laughs> Success. So in 40 years since it passed, 
there's been increases of, of a lot of marine mammals. Some have not had such success. So the North Atlantic right whale is one species, which unfortunately hasn't had that great success. There's only 350 right now in the whole population. But for pinnipeds and seals in particular here, it was a different story. So this is off Muskeget Island in Nantucket, and these are all gray seal pups, and these are pups on this island that is a historical pupping site. And the rate of pupping is pretty good. It's going up. So Muskeget Island and Monomoy are on the Cape. They're increasing. Seal Island in Maine is, is pretty good as well, 11, and Green Island is decreasing. But for the most part, this increase is pretty high. A lot of this comes from pup production and also animals that are coming from Canada. So while this is great, if you're like, yay, there's more marine mammals, um, it also has created conflict. And that conflict can be seen, I think, every day. If I just open the paper, open social media, it's there. And these are article headlines that have come from newspapers, not from the 1880s, but the uh, 2000s or 2010 to 15. Gray seal population, plague or pleasure. The seals are like vermin. They're a scourge to Nantucket. And these headlines just keep coming. I mean, it's it's almost like a game now. Like I can just go and cut and paste and cut and paste. Um, but you know, seals may be cold. Um, they're because of the shark, it's because of the seals. Oh, seal tsunami, that one's my favorite. Um, we need to counter the seal tsunami. Um, and this one I always need to bring up because this to me was shocking. This is an elected official calling for the, the, call, the call, call to call seals. And to me, that was kind of an extraordinary statement to hear, especially because it was surrounded by misinformation. So where do we go from here as scientists, as individuals, as artists, as landowners, as anybody with an interest, what do we do? So a group of us came together to try and figure out how do we better coexist? What can we as scientists do to help manage not the the science necessarily, but the misinformation or information that we need to understand how do we live in this world where rebounding species are coming back. And we formed the Northwest Atlantic Seal Research Consortium, Lisa Seti, who's been out here, who's uh, one of the founding people to this, and Owen Nichols is a part of this as well, it's also part of Schultz. Um, and really the mission of this is to work collaboratively to understand the ecological role of seals in the Northwest Atlantic. And really it is a consortium where anybody can can have conversations and talk and bring people together to help solve issues. So from that fast forward, you know, there's been a lot of conversations to try and figure this out. What do we know? There's so much we don't know. We're still trying to understand for species that have such conflict. We're trying to understand still the basics. I mean, basics, that's where we're at. And that's kind of what I wanted to share a little bit about is where we're at in the, the ecology life, this, the social human dimension aspects are so important to know. So we've done this all as a community um, by tracking, tagging, sampling, doing cooperative research and a lot of counting. Um, and so when I come here and I get you know, the opportunity to teach the next generation, thanks Ingemar and Angie, to help with the counting, it's so important because it's part of this long-term process of understanding what do we need to know. So some of the big questions I get are how many seals are there now and where did they come from? And I wanted to pose these as questions because as a community scientist, someone that's working with people to understand the questions they have that's where these questions come from. That's where we want to know this. It's not just for the sake of science, but it's so that we can communicate and we can try and work on these coexistence issues and help get the data that we need to do that. And these really are the biggest questions and where effort, energy, and priorities go as a community to try and answer. And they're also priorities under the Marine Mammal Protection Act that we need to know as well, and especially how many are there. So how many are there and where did they come from? So I told you that these seals were extirpated, gray seals. So they didn't just come out of the big blue ocean out of nowhere. We didn't like, you know, DNA didn't come together. There's a small island off here. We didn't just create them. Um, it's called Sable Island. And those animals that recolonized their historical pupping grounds came from this island way offshore <laughs> called Sable Island. 
And from Sable Island, this repopulation or rebound of species was able to happen. So today, what we know is that there's 500,000 gray seals or half a million, and we have 70,000 harbor seals. And this is in the entirety of the Northwest Atlantic. We don't have, as we know right now, and this could change, we have one big Northwest Atlantic population. Um, we do know that through pupping, we have about 27,000 gray seals in US waters, and that's based on pup production. Um, and those numbers are so important because they're part of the bigger picture. They're not just Cape Cod seals. Many people say, oh, they're just Cape Cod seals, they're born there, but they're part of this bigger system. And that's really important to know, especially if we want to understand more about questions like this. What do seals eat? I'm telling you, like the basics, that's where we're at, is really trying to understand basics. And this question becomes really important because there's a lot of misperception or conflict that comes about with just this question, what do they eat? You'll get a lot of feedback from asking that question and a lot of different answers. Um, but before we talk about the answer to that question, it's really important to remember a couple things. Seals eat things in the ocean. That's where they live. They're going to eat fish. They're going to eat squid. They're going to eat the things that are near them. The other thing to remember is that ecosystems are complex. We can't just talk about what they eat without understanding how they fit into a system. And this is probably, again, one of the biggest misperceptions or pieces of information that a lot of people are working on is trying to figure out the ecological role of these animals and how do they fit into a food web. If you've ever seen a food web, this is what it looks like. It's not simple. It's not A to B to C. I ate a cod, then the seal ate the cod, and then the shark ate the seal. It's not that simple. And what's really important is this is where, say, a gray seal or a harbor seal would be in the system. And oftentimes, they're actually, people talk about them as top predators. They're not. They're meso predators. They should not be a top predator in a healthy ocean. And so now we're seeing a resurgence of their top predators, which I think is very exciting. But trying to understand what we knew in the past when we, we didn't have even those top predators and we were missing these meso predators is really important. And we're still trying to understand that. The other part to understand is that when an animal eats something, it's not just that it's eating something, there's other consequences. And so we like to talk about how seals maintain ecological stability. Well, how do they do this? So again, it's more complex than an animal just eating one thing. We have to think about what else is happening in the ocean system. And something to remember is that predatory fish are the greatest predator of other fish. It's not seals. Just put that out there. Um, it's other fish. What we do know and what we're starting to understand is that when there's an increase of small pelagic fish, such as things like hake, if you've ever seen a hake, um, we can actually see a decline in some of the ground fish like cod or failure of cod to recover. And the reason for that is these hake are not eating big cod that are out there, but the little eggs and the larva. And then we can see these changes occur at this very small animal scale that have really big impacts later. Seals are generalist um, and they eat what is abundant and hake in particular is a really abundant fish that they eat. And they also eat sand lance and flatfish and redfish and squid, but hake is a really big part of their diet. So how does that play into the role of these animals, especially when they're gone? And then again, when they're coming back again. So all these relationships and connections we're still trying to understand. So the other story I'd love to tell about how seals maintain ecological stability is this picture. This is off Sable Island in Canada, and those are gray seals and horses. And the reason I'm showing you this is because you can also see grasses and sand. So seals have been able to contribute something that has let horses thrive better than ever. And these are wild horses that are out there. Um, there's just scientists and horses and seals out there pretty much. But what happens is the seals leave something behind, we leave a little gift, and it causes the grasses to grow and the horses have food. And this relationship has been uncovered by really wonderful naturalists, by people really looking and understanding their world to see these changes. And with the seals coming there, there's also been a decrease in erosion, which is really important in places that are lacking those grasses to keep that land there. And I showed you a picture of sable. It is in the middle of nowhere in the ocean, so it could disappear quickly. So it's really interesting that these seals are actually contributing to the island's existence. So the other thing to ask before we even get to what they actually eat is where do they go? And this is a harder thing to answer 
sometimes um, because we have to catch them and put tags on them um, like this right here. This is Gracie, this is a seal that was captured in 2013. But when we do that, we can understand where these animals are going. And that's a really big part of this ecological picture of the ecological role of seals because they don't just go to one place, but they do have a preference. Um, and so these are adult gray seals that were tagged in 2013. It was the only adult gray seal tagging event that's happened in the US. Um, and these were nine animals. And what we saw was in the summertime, they really loved Cape Cod and they really loved Chatham and they stayed there. What's interesting in that area, and this kind of appears small up there, this is a diet study from Kristen Ampella from 2009. And she looked at scat. And if you're looking at diet from live seals in Cape Cod, it's a great sample to get. And in this scat, she found sandlands made up over half of their diet in these areas of, of scat collection on the shoreline. And that's what a sandlance looks like. It's a tiny little fish, it's not big. In the winter months, this is where the same seals went. You can see that it's a really different use of area. And what's interesting is if we look at the animals that are going offshore, we wanna know what they eat. One thing we can do is recover bycaught animals. And I always tell people I'm the optimist and I'm gonna make the best of everything and make lemonade out of lemons. And that's what we do. We get these bycaught seals that were incidentally caught and we can get a lot of data. And Fred Wenzel's data, this is from 2017, showed that all from 188 stomachs over, over 30 years, the primary diet in that orange box is something called hake. And we just talked about hake, right? So that's the primary diet of these animals that are going more offshore in winter months. And at least we know as well that they're not just eating hake, they're eating about 38 different species. They are generalists. They will eat what's abundant. And a lot of the times and studies that have happened since, there's been dozens of studies since, still show these same relationships of sand lance, hake, and flatfish as well being really important to the diet of gray seals. These are images from more recent pup captures that I'm so excited about. And this is lots of people working together. And this is from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center's um, website. And I highlighted it in case you have want to go because all the tag data is there. Um, but you can see, again, these are young animals and they're using a lot of the ocean. They're highly migratory, especially when they're young. And one of them looks like it's like making its way to Europe over there. Um, but these are some of those track lines. So you can see the distribution and just how varied they can be. So one's using the, the mid-Atlantic region, another one's going all the way to Sable Island in Nova Scotia and having a blast out in the middle of the ocean. Um, this is the one that I was joking went almost to Europe really far out and stopped um, transmitting in March. And this one I was so excited about, I went to check the last known location and this is right off there. Um, so that's why I keep saying, look for tagged animals. This is a satellite tagged animal. This was from a couple of days ago from the 13th of June. Um, it's around. So these animals move really far and we can actually understand more about their ecology, what they do if we have this information about where they go. So I would say the biggest controversy and usually the most um, tense conversations I have have to do with this issue between fisheries and seals. And in this conversation, in this story, and in this human relationship, whether or not we're trying to understand data or not, we have to understand each other and our perspectives. And we have to recognize that fisheries contend with depredation and competition. So seals are eating their, their fish. And I say that with the thought that we're uh, looking at commercially important species that humans want. And then we also have to recognize that seals contend with bycatch and entanglement. And this is probably one of the worst entanglement cases I've ever seen. And this was again, an animal right here off Duck Island. Um, and that causes not just um, concern for a population, but that individual animal as well. It's pretty horrible. But it does have consequences when we start talking about it at a population level. So right now, bycatch is above historical bounty hunt levels. So the bounties were taking out, say, equivalent in those 80 years, say about 1,000 animals a year. We know that there were 70 to 130 roughly seal, 30,000 seals bounty hunted in that time. Right now, we're over 2,000 animals a year being killed by incidental bycatch. So it's a concern and it's something that is very contentious right now, but something we have to be aware of and keep monitoring. But again, I'm an optimist and there's solutions to things. 
Um, and I really wanted to highlight that as well, where the people part of the story becomes so important, not just the science that we're creating in a data sheet, but how we talk to each other. So my friend and colleague who works here as well um, in the summer just taught sustainable fisheries, Owen and I, Owen Nichols and Dee Allen, worked to put together a paper based on workshops that we had put together of how do you communicate? How do you do community science? How do you get people talking to one another about these seal fishery interactions so that we could have a framework for other people to kind of follow suit if they wanted to as well? Because there are solutions to the problem that, that you can work on. So that's probably the biggest. The other biggest one is this. In case you hadn't heard, there's sharks in the ocean. Who would have guessed? I know, it's amazing. Um, and this, this critter right here has caused a lot of stir in our, in our waters on the Cape and in Maine for good reasons. Um, they are large apex top predators. Um, but there's this thought that these animals, for some reason, people think they've never been here before. Um, and what proof do we have that they have been here before? These are two images of a shark, great white sharks, or I should say white sharks, not great white, white sharks, that came from 1938 off of Cape Cod. And we know that they were there, 1938. They were present. We know they were there. Thoreau wrote about it in Thoreau's Cape Cod. So we know they were there hundreds of years ago. But for some reason, there's this perception or idea that they haven't. And this is an old picture that I love when I first started working for the Cape Cod Stranding Network ages ago of a large gray seal. This is 1999 with a large bite out of it from a large shark. So this isn't new. It's just that there's a lot of media hype and these animals are both returning to our waters. Um, and these are pictures, thanks Angie and Ingemar, that were taken on the survey last week of, we're still trying to figure out if they're the same seal or not, so we have to do photo ID. But those marks have been confirmed to be shark bites, um, and this animal survived a large animal <laughs> off our waters last week. No, these are um, healed scars, but it's just to remind us that we are living in an ocean that is wild and that's what we want. We want this rewilding of our ocean because these animals help support a healthy ecosystem and seals are a big part of that. We need our top predators, our meso predators, um, and they support not just healthy ecosystems for us, um, but they help transfer nutrients. They're part of our system and they also help us economically as well. Um, we know that this study has been done in Whales always get more credit than seals, but I just think this is extraordinary. So the International Monetary Fund did a study um, to see what the value of large whales were in the world. And they said that it could be over a trillion dollars in value for the current stock of great whales if we had to put a value on them. And that comes from the nutrient exchanges that occur that whales give back when they die or they poop and they provide uh, nutrients in our oceans. So I challenge people to think about this in a different way. Let's think about seals in that way. How do seals fit into this system? Let's, let's understand that narrative in a way where we can understand what the value of these animals are to us as well. And the value to me is extraordinary. Um, and I feel so grateful that I've been able to spend, this is year 12, because I was able to come out during COVID and I'm so excited to count seals out here, made it through. Um, where we have had SEAL Team Shoals. And the SEALs of Duck Island have taught us a lot about this area. And one of my favorite um, stories to share in the stories is to become familiar, familiar with these animals as individuals in a population. So he's my favorite SEAL, so I had to bring him up. And this is Mr. T. And he's been recited nine years out of those years. And he's called Mr. T because he has this little T. Um, but students are out here um, really helping to make this this amazing long-term data set where we can do long-term population assessments of harboring gray seals and in this process have understood so much about injuries entanglements changes in populations we've been out here when there have been two unusual mortality events in 2011 and 2018 and we can actually see some of the changes that have been happening before those events occurred um, it's a really special place to me um, when i was first starting a lot of my research back in 2005, we were able to pick up a seal that actually was the first isolate of something called focine distemper virus. And it came off a seal right there. And that's where this only isolate came from, was this beautiful island where these seals live right here. So whether it's population health, they're understanding these animals as sentinels, they're here. And it's a beautiful place on top of it that you get to do this work. 
Um, and there's so many stories that come out of it. Again, not just the, the science itself, but understanding these relationships and figuring out what more we can ask to understand this little, this little place that tells us a story about this bigger area that we live in in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and I should say this image is a drone image. We usually do surveys by boat. And this is from Michael Moore, who came out a couple times to see if we could actually do this as a proof of concept. And it's really helped us um, understand some of the bigger issues. And again, I'm an optimist, right? You want to figure out how to solve problems. And one of the biggest one is this entanglement. And this is a picture of a seal from today um, that we went out on a survey. And this pink stuff that's on the neck of the seal is some kind of um, monofilament line of some type, we have no idea, but this is pervasive. This is what we see out there more and more. Um, and that's that animal that kind of breaks my heart that we looked out there years ago. But using some of these really cool collaborative sort of work using drones that Michael came out and, and brought out there, we could actually start looking at images a little more closely. And this is a close up of the one in the corner there that's entangled. And from this have created a really important data set. And I'd like to point out Eilish Holes is right there as part of this data set that shows the, the prevalence of entanglement in Chatham and out here for gray seals. And it's actually been incorporated into stock assessment reports as important to look at, which is incredible to have done and have that be part of this data set. So it's making big changes from this little island and this, this study that we're doing to understand some of these complex, really controversial topics. So hopefully we can get info. So there's still so much more we have to learn and these seals are never a shortage of inspiration. Um, and I can say that it really every day is different. Um, and I wanted to put this up here because this kind of blew my mind. And I think I was like in tears of joy when um, Brian Scarry, who's a photographer, an amazing photographer, told me that a gray seal at the Eilish Shoals was going to be on the cover of Nat Geo. And I don't think I've ever had a happier day understanding that somebody else understood how important it was, not just to tell the science, but to tell the story. And so I leave that, I guess, as part of that inspiration to everyone of you never know where your science can go or how important it is to somebody else. But just listening to other people and hearing their stories is so important so that we can do better for our, our ocean and our world and these animals as well. We'll only get there if we start listening to each other and telling these stories. So with that, I leave you and say thank you. These are seals right there. And I think they're, they're having fun out there. But if you have questions, ask away and I'm, I'm happy to answer. Oh, do I have to stop sharing to see them or? Oh yeah, you can ask questions online. Yeah. Because I can't see them. <laughs> yeah, so anyone has any questions, please ask. Yeah, ask away in here online. How many of you have gone out to see the seals that are in here? All right, how many have not? All right, we need to change that. Okay, good, good. <laughs> we need to change that, yeah. See if you can see Mr. T when you guys are out there. Yeah. Um, we discussed media hype as part of the problem in the ocean community. In your ideal world uh, scenario, how would media be reporting on seals who were responsible? That's a wonderful question. Um, I, I don't know if I should repeat it, if it could be heard, but what is the best way to address media's misinformation and how should they respond? Is that, yeah. Um, so I have found to be a responsible journalist or, or media is to ask the people, that, uh, the experts in the field to help you answer the questions in the story that you're writing about. Um, and to that, I would say to anyone who's creating a headline to really think about what that headline says. Um, is it clickbait or are you trying to be a responsible journalist? And it's really important, I have found, and I thank all the journalists who have listened, to call them and use the telephone as a scientist, as an expert, and use that hat, use that expertise to drive what is correct. And that is the responsibility of scientists. It is your responsibility with that knowledge and expertise to drive that conversation. So I call them, <laughs> that's the solution and see if there's somebody on the other end willing to do a story about the real story. Yeah, hopefully that helps answer.
Yeah, absolutely. Yes, glad to. So there are many methods that are used. Um, hard parts is one way that comes from the seal you have the stomach from. So most of the time a dead seal or from the scat and you can look for hard parts. The other way that's become more common because it's more accessible is DNA. So using DNA from um, scat stomach contents, basically anything you can get dead or alive, you can isolate the DNA. And that's been really incredible to get these reads from, I mean, thousands of reads to understand the quantity of what type of DNA is there, which is great because sometimes seals don't eat the heads of fish and you won't get the hard parts, the otoliths that help you identify the fish species. You can also use stable isotopes and you can use fatty acids. And the best studies are those which use multiple methods. And that's what people are doing now is putting all those together. Um, and then the other part that becomes really important that we've been looking at is depredated catch. So looking at the parts of fish that are left from the fishing operations and assessing what depredated them. And you can tell if they were seal sometimes by the type of marks that are left behind from their canines. So sometimes that's a good way too. It's a little harder, but the DNA is it's just game changer for what we understand. Yeah. What methods are used to like prevent accidentally catching seals with the nets? Like they're like radar. Ah, such a great question. Um, what was that? Oh, it what's being used to prevent seals from being caught in nets? Um, like what is out there? So we don't have good deterrent devices. This was actually a topic of a recent um, series of conversations with Noah. There's, it's really hard to deter seals. So there's pingers, which is a high frequency sound, which are used for um, cetaceans or, or adonisites, whales and dolphins and porpoises that can hear a high frequency. Um, and there's nothing like that really for seals. There's something called a screecher, which is being tested. It's like a, a, a it's annoying, it's a sound that's annoying, but it hasn't yet been um, fully used and effective. And so there's a, a group in the UK and Scotland um, trying to make this happen. Um, and right now what we're trying to work on is just behavior modifications. How do you fish differently? Are there times of day? Is there type of net? Are there ways that just changing our behavior might be more effective than putting a device that we're hoping will be the magic bullet to it? I have questions from online. Yeah. So, a Charles Patterson Carey Keo says, Great talk. Thanks, Carrie. And she wants to know a little bit more about your community science work. How do you develop productive relationships with people who see seals so differently? Ah, uh, great. Should, should I? It's that's you got it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Should I repeat it? No. no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> great question, Carrie. Um, Time. I think time is the first one, and I would say snacks is the second. No, um, it's to build trust with each other, whether you're a colleague, a friend, or somebody with opposing views. I think listening is really the key part. And it's so easy to, you know, that internal feeling that you get when you're like, this isn't right. Like, I know more. I have data. Like, that's just a science thing, I think, too. That's not right is to kind of suppress that and remember you're talking to a person who has really strong feelings and beliefs that may be different from you, but you can still have a conversation. And people really like to share and understand that they're being heard. And I think listening to people is, is how you do it. Um, whether that's inviting somebody to have a cup of coffee or sit down together at a park or wherever the conflict is happening. And that's happened many times with me. Um, I think Lisa and I were at a talk together and we just, we had a two hour conversation with somebody after the talk, we made the time. So that's how it works. It's, I think about being there listening and providing somebody who's not there just to give an answer, but to be there to listen. And then you can have a dialogue and starting that dialogue is so crucial. Questions from our mind. Yeah. So Krista, who was a um, Shoals alum from 94. Hey, Krista, thanks for being here. Um, says, hello, Appledore. My family and I sail a lot around Casco Bay. Are there any citizen science projects that take data on seal sites? Love it. Um, yes. So hopefully it's back up again. We had to like shut it down for a little bit because apparently there was nefarious activity. There was something happening at um, the, woods, the Woods Hole site, but it's 
main marine animal identification network dot dot edu is the easiest site to find so it's n-a-i-n dot dot edu and it's um, a site that we put up for people to report interesting sightings with that i will say if you ever see a stranded injured seal you should call your local marine mammal stranding network and i don't know casco if it's marine mammals of maine or coa we'll go marine mammals of maine maine's big um, but that's who you should contact first. So if there's something that you think needs attention, do that. And if it's not, if it's just interesting, you can report your sighting to maine.hui.edu. Any more questions? <laughs> How are seals affected by warming in the Gulf of Maine? Great question. We still need to know. I think that's a big one people ask all the time. How are they affected? Um, there's a lot of thoughts about what might happen and most of that revolves around how prey might move in the Gulf of Maine and how they're affected but the timing the warming can affect physiology it can affect disease it can affect health so there's a lot out there we're still trying to understand and don't have an answer for but are collecting the data to figure out what's changing and that's why long-term data sets are so important that we can have something to go back to and understand what happened 10 years before 15 years before. Um, and that's really important to understand. I think there's a question. He's been raising his hand too in the back of it. <laughs> Did I hear you right that 2,000 seals were fighting cat and One does, one doesn't. So the question was, or, or confirming, yes, there are 2,000 seals now dying every year in as incidental bycatch. Yes, it is more of a specific fishery. The highest number comes from St. Gilnet fisheries in southern New England down to Rhode Island. That's the highest um, rate, or I should say concentration. Part of that is where these seals are pupping, breeding, and then dispersing from is that area as well in the fishery overlap at that same time. So that's a big reason for it. And there's a great paper that Kimberly Murray just put out overlapping tracking data with where fisheries are happening that helps to understand that relationship and why that's occurring. So how to get out of the bubble and disentanglement efforts, right? Okay. So how do, how do you get out of the bubble? No, great questions. Um, I say, at least with SEAL conversations, it was stepping back and trying to understand, well, one, where are SEALs being talked about in this way and inserting yourself into conversations. So, you know, a lot of that is fisheries, to be honest. So I started learning more about fisheries and understanding fisheries management and going to council meetings and understanding there's a lot of conflict, but I was present um, and could be there. The other is areas that um, were working with organizations or people that you trust that may be part of that alternate um, sense of what is happening or what is different and putting yourself out there to be like, can I be a resource? I'd like to have a conversation. I think a lot of it is making people aware that you want to engage, not confront, but engage and talk. And so that's some of the work I think I have done is just make sure that I am a person that somebody can talk to and not feel threatened by or that I'm there because I'm going to bring him, you know, some enforcement or anything like that. I just really want to have a conversation, understand. Um, and the second about disentanglement, um, the International Fund for Animal Welfare has done a really amazing job having a disentanglement effort, but it's really difficult. They've done remote sedation on the beach um, and with large, especially male seals, it's really difficult. And they've had mixed success um, with the effort it takes and the risk about what you have to do to sedate these animals. So little animals, it's much easier. You can catch them 
that, that happens up and down the coast, the harder part, and, and uh, Nantucket actually has a large number of these small entangled animals and they've been doing great. Um, mm. But the larger animals are more difficult, like that animal that I showed a picture of, it's really difficult. So the solution is really to keep it from happening, hopefully in the first place. Yeah, Good, great questions. Another one, last one online. How do you calculate the population sizes? <laughs> I don't calculate the population sizes. That we leave to, um, to NOAA to definitely do. And it's a process of understanding the correction factors of how many seals are in the water, out of the water. Aerial surveys take place and counts take place in same areas year, well, year after year if they can, so that you have a, a standardized data set to use about where these animals can be located. So most of the time when surveys are done, it's when you're, you're gonna maximize the number of animals that are out of the water. So when they're, when they're pupping is one time for harbor seals or when they're molting for gray seals. Um, and so a lot of these numbers, especially for the, how to know the increases come from when they're pupping. So that's when surveys are conducted. So um, gray seal work, if you're doing counts isn't, like it's the middle of winter and it's January and it's really cold, but it's really fun, right? To do that work. And then um, harbor seals are popping in April and May. So that's the time you might see most of them actually hauled out. So time of year, knowing their life history, planes, <laughs> aerial surveys, and trying to understand animals in and out of the water, all those things come together and you can find a population size. I just like totally distilled that down in like this big, but it's a lot bigger than that. Could you explain um, why this Liberty Mammal Protection Act is ineffective? And also, if you could make one policy to better protect seals, what would it be? Wow. So why was the MMPA ineffective? Like for right whales, you mean? Or, okay. Um, so for some species, it's it's there's a lot of hypotheses about what has happened with right whales. Is it that the population became so low that you, if the recovery is difficult? And now we have all these other threats in the ocean, like entanglement, ship strike, that are just hammering these animals. And so it's protection, but not at a level that we need it to be protected at, which is our human behaviors. I mean, we all are guilty. I have an, I have a computer that was not made here and a phone that was not made here. It shipped over here, right? So that's one part. And for some species, um, they're doing really well because the populations can rebound, like a lot of the seal populations. Oh, man, one piece of legislation. Um, I would say I would put into place funding to help rebounding species specifically. There's so much out there to help recovery, endangered species that are at the brink, but people aren't thinking about the human economic social costs or complications that are coming from rebounding species. There's nothing out there. That's what I would do is put in place something that can help people coexist and help solve those conflicts at that level across the board as an ecosystem, not just as one species, but address those conflicts together. So maybe like a coexistence framework law. I don't know. <laughs> Great question, thank you. All right, well, join me. Thank you, Thank you. All right, so next week, same time, same place, uh, Dr. Corey Evans from Rice University is going to be with us online. And um, his research teases apart the complex interplay between the environment and genetics as they shape the evolution of fish morphology and function. <laughs> <laughs> happens to be one of the classes out here. <laughs> all right, all of these talks uh, this year and past years have been recorded. They are on our website. So feel free to look at and share all of those resources. Thank you everyone for coming here and online. Have a great night. Thanks. <laughs>